Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans, and let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 274, and we are in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, going to the end of the chapter. We talk about the redemption of Jesus' blood, how uh, there is a, we're building on the concept of there's a perfect version of God's holy tent in heaven, and how he entered that place as a perfect sacrifice for us in heaven. And how everything down here then is redeemed through his sacrifice that puts their trust in him. Second opportunity that God gave humanity over and above the law. So, can't wait to get into that. First, I want to say thank you. I see all your love. I see your likes. I see your shares. Here's what I don't see. And I don't need to see. I don't know if you're sharing some of these uh, messages and um you know, in just a text message. And I don't know if you're sharing in just with a friend or a friend group in an email group, or if you are passing my name on to a prayer group. And that's great because God knows. He sees what is done in secret and he blesses those who work uh, just in faith, okay? So if God has opened those doors for you with people to use these messages, and if you're watching for the first time, and you're like, what's he talking about? Well, I'm just saying that when you teach the word and it goes out, it goes out and it doesn't return void, empty, without having done the work which God purposed it to do. That's an Old Testament prophecy. It's a promise and uh, it remains true today. So if you're sharing the word out there, if you've been obedient to God's calling in your life, God bless you. If you haven't been obedient to God's word, if you haven't been obedient to God's calling in your life, and that means not necessarily sharing the stuff that I'm putting out, but maybe even sharing stuff that God shows you you need to start teaching. Whatever it is, however it is that God's been working on your heart lately, please, please, please heed that call that God has on your life. Just take the first step. You can't get to the mountaintop unless you start that walk. And that's part and parcel to the message which I have with keep walking. It's like keep walking through the Bible. It's keep walking in faith. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep walking in the Holy Spirit. Keep walking. But walking isn't standing still. It means you're moving. It means you take a step. And it's a whole journey to get up a trail. Okay, so you can't look at the view and the vista and the butte unless you start at the trailhead. So wherever you're at, keep walking, all right? All right, pep talk done. Got to get a sip of coffee. Hmm, hope you're doing well. You got some light rain out. and You can just feel the, the breeze. The, uh, it's moving through the trees. You can see it. And... Uh, yeah, you hear the rain sort of splatting on the uh, on the roof there. It's beautiful. Anyway, okay, so why don't we stop and let's pray. Lord, I love you. God, thanks for your word. Thank you for each person that decided to turn on this, um, this time in your word today. God, please bless them right now. God, help them heed the call that you've given them in your life, in their life, from your life, I guess. And um, help them take steps forward, Lord. Help them take steps, period. Help them to stop standing still. And those that have slowed their pace and know they should pick it back up again, God, help them. God, help them keep walking. Lord, I love you, and I just ask you to bless this word. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Yeah, so we're going to pick up in chapter 9, verse 11. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Uh, you can find that for free on esv.org. Esv.org. And there you can also get, I think Zondervan gives you a free study Bible as well if you download the app. So, good notes context, history, pretty good interpretations by my estimation. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything any teacher says, 
always do your research, always do your own digging, okay? And you may change your opinion on things over the years. You aren't gonna get to heaven and get a grade on, was your, was your theology perfect, okay? That's not the grade. Did you memorize every verse in your uh, memory verse club? You know, that's not the grade. All this stuff is good and helpful and useful for all the purposes that God has for his word. Okay, teaching, monishing, reproof, all of it, instruction. Okay, so don't, don't stress out when it comes to like, did I get my theology perfect? None of us have our theology perfect. We're doing our best, but God gives us an awful lot of clarity. And so spend time with him in his word. All right, enough. Let's, let's get in his word. So verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one is, who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you and in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship indeed under the law almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Mm -mm. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things, the heavenly things, themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Now it now it was to offer himself repeat now was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own? For then he should have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Wow. So, a note. <laughs> we have 
copies of heavenly things down here on earth. And then you have the real deal in heaven. So what Jesus did was the full and real deal. And it satisfied the real place of meeting, tent of meeting in heaven. And all of its functionality. Okay. So let's go back and let's just look at the first, uh, first paragraph here. The first chunk. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Okay, he did so, he went into that holy place in heaven, the one that's in the presence of the Father, Hebrews says. He went there, not through, like, the sacrifice of goats and sheep and, you know, other, you know, turtle dove sacrifices and all this, right? Which were all given under the first covenant and all given under the law. And they were the copy of these heavenly things. He didn't enter into heaven through those same processes. Okay. Jesus's parents sacrificed a couple turtle doves as as was required by the law on his behalf on the eighth day when he was circumcised and presented to the temple as the firstborn son we read about that in the gospels we read about it every christmas if you do advent readings okay so jesus's life participated in the first covenant as a human person born of israel fully participating in, in the law. He was not in any way at odds with the law during his time on earth. And it's entirely likely based upon his trip that is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, where you remember when he's talking with the teachers in the temple and whatnot, and they love, they're like, whoa, amazed at this little guy who's answering and asking questions and all that. And then he, then he ups and sticks around and his family loses track of him on their journey back. So they come back, look for him, they find him and what. But what does that mean? It means that they had gone up for the, the Passover. They'd gone up for all the feasts. And you even see that implied by his brothers when they're like, hey, you know, no, no one does in secret, you know, what's supposed to be out in public, you know, no prophet hides himself. So they're kind of goading him to going up to uh, Jerusalem for the feast. And, and Jesus is like, I'm not going up to this feast, blah, blah, blah. I've got this and that. And then he ends up going up. Jesus shows up at all the feasts, even during his ministry, which is a ministry of the new covenant, of this second covenant, this prophesied covenant that the author of Hebrews has talked about. The one that the author of Hebrews is talking about in this context of, of the heavenly tent, the place in which Jesus himself is offered up as a perfect sacrifice, not of the, the blood of bulls, not of the blood of calves, not of the blood of any animal, but his own blood, right? So the point is, is Jesus fulfilled the law as he was walking here on earth and abided in the first covenant, but then he himself didn't enter by offering sacrifices as he did through his life, as it as were done in and amongst his family, for his family, he entered into that place in heaven through his perfect sacrifice of himself on the cross. Okay? So he didn't do one last ritual, that last Passover feast, the last supper, right? None of that. None of that was what got him through the, the, the gates of, of heaven, as it were, into the presence of the Father in the tent and meeting in heaven, where his sacrifice was received, pure, holy, absolute, right, good. That is how he got there, through his sacrifice on the cross. Okay, So there's no amount of sacrifices, no amount of red heifers, pure, holy, sacrifices of any religion let alone this first covenant that god gave mo gave the people of israel through moses 
none of it could add up to the perfection in God's perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. Let's look at the second point. There is this holy place in heaven. And did Jesus die in heaven? Okay, I know that sounds weird, but let's just read this next section. And I'm not going to argue for that, but I can also say why pretty famous Bible teacher believes that there was some sort of sacrifice or some sort of display. Okay. For all, okay, therefore he is a mediator. For if the blood of goats and bulls sprinkled the defiled persons, ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore he is a mediator, the mediator rather, of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood, and he goes on to talk about how Moses did that. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifices than these, okay? So the heavenly things with which all those things down here on earth, all these things which God set aside, the tent of meeting, all the altar, everything, the copies, there's a heavenly reality, a heavenly altar, a heavenly t table, heavenly tent of meeting, as it were. They had to be sacrificed and, and rather sprinkled with the blood of sacrifice. They had to be purified. Well, yeah, interesting. That's what it says. The heavenly things to be purified with these rites, not the, not the blood and bulls, but the heavenly things themselves had to be purified with better sacrifices. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our, on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear sins for many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He entered that holy place and he stood there as Revelation says, as, a, as though a lamb that was slain. So one pastor, one great teacher who teaches through the Bible, he's long since gone to be with Jesus, he argued at length that <clears throat> this passage implied that though he died here on earth, in an eternal sense, he experienced that eternal death and rebirth in this place of heaven right that he had to as the passage says experience that sacrifice he did so down here in the copy of things right on the cross and he did so in the heavenly place in the heavenly altar before god all the attending elders angels whatnot and he appeared as a lamb slain. He was dead in their presence. Now, as you can tell, I'm giving as much credence to that as I can to honor that teacher, good Bible teacher. But I don't think he died twice. 
And I think the text is pretty clear. It's pointing to die once. So <clears throat> I think that he, Jesus, when he died and his journeys after death, you know, down to, he to hell or Hades, however you want to interpret that, to proclaim the good news to those there. Jesus stands, as we see in Revelation, as implied here or spoken of here in Hebrews, stands in the presence of God in the true tent of meeting, the true holy building, the holy temple of God. And he is, in fact, translated dead and made alive. Something to that effect. For those that say that Jesus merely died, and when he rose after the three days, and make it as simplistic as possible, he was alive, beaten, dead on a cross, buried, resurrected. To me, the author of Hebrews is like kind of like, hey, that's sort of the ABC one two three version. And it's all true. There's some nuance here. And we're trying to teach you these more mature things. So when we're digging into these more mature things and trying to understand, okay, so there's this place in heaven and he stands before the Father and the heavenly host and perhaps the elders who fall down and worship the Lord night and day, right? As we see in Revelation. And Revelation shares with us that he stands there as a slain lamb. Right before they ask, well, who's worthy, right, to open the scroll? Title deed to the earth. Somewhere in the process after the moment of his death on the cross, when he gives up his spirit to the, to the Lord, There is this scene. Now here's the next point. It's important. It's not a side issue. In fact, there's something about this that is actually instrumental to your and my being made right with God, period. If you just take the death on the cross here on earth and the resurrection from the dead, risen, he is risen. We do this every Easter. He is risen. Praise the Lord. It's good stuff. And we skip over what this Hebrew author is saying. We're missing something about the actual functionality, the inner workings, the nuts and bolts of our salvation. So what does it say? It means that there's something about what he did on earth when it talks about dying here in flesh and blood for the children of Abraham who are flesh and blood, which is incredibly important. He took on our nature. There's something about him standing in the presence of the father sacrificed in the actual heavenly place in the actual heavenly temple that is necessary for our admission into heaven. So what does that imply? If Christ died here, buried here, resurrection, goes to heaven alive, doesn't stand in the presence in the holy temple slain, isn't isn't I don't want to say killed again because he didn't die twice, but isn't presented, sacrificed in the holy temple in his heavenly nature, bearing also our earthly nature, then perhaps the process of our salvation, the process of his salvation work isn't complete. You're like, what does that matter? Who cares? Well, maybe you don't. 
but there's something here that's so important. What is it? There's stuff here about the reality of heaven, which we walk over, which we pass by, which we don't dwell on. Some things are too high for me, Lord, says King David. Amen. I mean, some things are. There, there is a reverence and an awe for the glory of God and the, that which is beyond our simple minds, right? Childlike faith, amen. But here we are being called to, to mull over the depth, the depth and mature things of Scripture. So what in the world is going on in heaven? What, in, what is going on with a dead Jesus, as it were, standing in the true temple of God, in the place where everything down here was merely a pattern, a shadow of? Now the final point. How does that make the Lord, the Father, feel? To see him, his exact imprint, his very nature, his beloved, only begotten Son, punished, sacrificed at the hands of the of the absolute exp expression of rebellion of his creation that rejected him. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Wait till I make your enemies before your feet. Oh, come sit at my right hand. Father says to his son. Behold, I'll make your enemies sitting with me. Our Father in heaven loves his son in ways which our love for our kids is merely a shadow. A far and away true, right, good, but far and away copy of what true love is. Our Father in Heaven knows and loves reality of His Son in His life. And I believe if we're looking at the variations, the, the distinctions, the differences, the qualitative nature and differences of things, he loves his son above, beyond, forevermore, fully holy than anything that's ever been made. And that includes you and I. That doesn't make his love for us any, any less real, any less meaningful. Doesn't make it any less true or felt. Yes, God feels, tells us he does. But his love, his absolute admiration for his son is, is paramount. And if you put yourself in the position of him, as, as he gives us this insight, and he, he's sitting there, wrapped in light, looking at his battered son standing before him in a holy, perfect heaven in temple. His, if it could be possible, his admiration and love for his son in this moment of reality couldn't be greater. And his love for those who will be reached through that sun couldn't be greater. And his anger 
and wrath towards those who reject him couldn't be more starkly contrasted. Jesus, standing in the presence of his Father and the holy angels in the true temple, the true tent of meeting, battered, slain, sacrificed, out of love for his Father, out of love for this world. his dad asked him to and he did it God loves you so much I can barely see it what I'm talking about I'm just barely grasping it and I think about this stuff but I can kind of barely wincingly see it can you all right well, until next time, day 275, keep walking, keep walking. God bless you. Bye-bye.